I'm going to speak uh, this morning on on destiny destroyers. Jesus made some very interesting statements. He said, Satan comes to rob, to steal and destroy, but I have come to give you life and to give it in abundance. And, and he's not necessarily talking about, uh, you know, having the best things in life. And, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not from a materialistic perspective. But for every dream we have, Can I have my words please? For every dream we have, there will be a proportionate challenge and struggle. Life is a series of struggles, right? How many of you have discovered that? And, and just when you think you've got over one, if you don't determine in your heart to have resilience and tenacity, you will live a less than life. You will never arrive at the destination that God has predetermined for your life because in some way we talk about the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of God is too complex for any human being to understand. But in order for the sovereignty of God to find fulfillment, there is a measure of responsibility on our part. In the book of Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14, there's a very deep and profound verse which says, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. So man is created in the image and likeness of God, we are created male and female with different distinctions. And difference in itself is not wrong as long as difference can unite what Satan wants to divide. Emotions have the power to take us towards our God-given purpose or away from it. And as we read the stories of some people in the Bible, we discover how they lived a less than life. And they never reached the extent of the potential that God had determined for them. Emotions can stop our turn, the God given turn that God wants to bring. And you know, as I uh, began to look at these passages of scripture and I look back over my personal life and the lives of others and I could see patterns of failure in many people whom I knew and know who lived a less than life because they didn't know how to manage those negative emotions that are self-defeating and destructive. I like the person who told me months long ago, Pastor, good message. I wish so and so was there. When God speaks to you or wants to speak to you, don't pass it on. That's the starting point. And, and the first thing I want to talk about is, is offense. Because as we look at the scriptures, Jesus warned, Luke 17 verse 1, offense is one of the signs of the end times. Offenses will increase. And some cultures, particularly Eastern cultures, are rooted in the demonic and are more vulnerable to offense than some other cultures. You only need to read social media or read comments in the daily news or the Hindu times to, to discover that. Jesus warned. And when he gives a warning, 
It is for us to allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate truth to our lives so that when the opportunity to get offended comes, we know how to navigate past it. Genesis chapter 4 verse 3 downwards. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the first fruit of the ground, and Abel brought an offering from the flock. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had disrespect. So Cain was angry and his face fell. You see, offense is toxic. And medically, they say, when people allow the spirit of offense to linger, there are chemicals that are released into your system that are toxic and detrimental to your emotional, physical and spiritual well-being. Now you are not responsible for your emotions. And I'll tell you why in a little while. And you look at yourself sometimes and you wonder why is it that I am more vulnerable to offense and anger and insecurity and fear. These are all interconnected emotions. Why am I like this and somebody else responds to the same challenge in a different way? So Cain is upset because in verse 7 is the issue of acceptance. Some people want acceptance and validation all the time because emotionally there is an empty hole in their lives as a consequence of dysfunctional fathering which nobody else on this planet can fool other than God. So we have to stop blaming ourselves for the way we feel. We got to stop blaming our parents or our fathers for doing or not doing things that they should have done. And we have to grow up spiritually and emotionally and take responsibility for our lives after we come to that realization of truth. Nobody can do it for us. I've had to take personal responsibility for my emotional well-being. And I have had to draw a pathway for my life where I can focus more on emotional well-being than spiritual development because the two have to go hand in hand. I know personally some great pastors who are the most dysfunctional on the planet. And they can preach to thousands and thousands of people and that's great and wonderful but in their homes they are a disaster and you only need to talk to the wife to find them. Talk to my wife, she give me a good report. This function isn't a limitation. It needn't be. If we are willing to work hard on those areas of life, where we need to build a sense of emotional resilience and say this is what happened or did not happen to me but I am refusing to stay there. Now 20 years ago there were no books, there were no Google. You know Google is the next best thing to Vegemite and craft cheese. So self-development. You and I can't depend on our spouses to do it for us. We're going to do it for ourselves. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has brought me to this earth to heal the broken hearted and set the captive free. And so you and I, by God's grace, can find 
total freedom and, and liberation in an emotional sense if we are willing to work at it. And let me tell you, it's hard work. Because the moment you make a decision to move in that direction, all hell will break loose around you. But you have to stay the path. That's the difference. The Lord told him, verse 7, if you did well, would you not be accepted? Sin lies at your door. Its desire is to rule over you. But you must learn to take responsibility for it. Offense, unresolved, has the power to take us away from our God determined destiny. And it's said, because in verse 15 and 16, the Lord said unto Cain, for 14, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be healed. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond all the days of my life. You see, offended people have what I call a orphan spirit. An orphan spirit is a young man's response to a lack of positive emotional fathering in early childhood. 80% of men in any state penitentiary anywhere in the world have had an issue with the father. That's frightening. And I sincerely believe that the one relationship Satan will attack most is the relationship between a father and a son because that will perpetuate itself in every generation now. That's right. I'm reminded of a story. Somebody who used to be in this church told me when his father was buried, he stood there by the grave and, you know, they give you a handful of dirt. He just took it and took it. And he's a Christian. And I understood where he's coming from. In that last final act of farewell, his emotions got the devil. And then it was closed and it was too late to go in. It was a reaction, not something he thought through. But at the end of his life, he said, this is what I think of you. And my heart goes out to people like that. Because they are in the majority, not the minority. In the book of Genesis 27, Esau hated Jacob, verse 41, Genesis 27, 41. Because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the day of mourning for my father is at hand, then I will slay my brother. Esau, verse 34, cried with a great and exceeding cry, saying, Bless me, Father. Bless me. Isn't that a blessing for me? Family favoritism produces dysfunctional children. Esau knew that Jacob loved, uh, that his father, Isaac loved Jacob and not him. And so from Esau's perspective, his father was never part of his emotional life. The days of my morning, father's morning are approaching. Then I will think of God. He ended up living a less than life because his offense 
forced him to take apart that God never intended. These are real stories, real life situations where one thing can perpetuate a cycle that goes beyond us. And it's interesting. They reconcile eventually, but they part a company, two brothers, and they only met each other after their father's death. That wasn't God's intention for the family. But when conflict is too big to resolve, through love, grace, and forgiveness, then we move in opposite directions to the divine purpose and plan. And one act of defiance downsized his dream and he ended up living a listener, spiritualism. Esau's anger and offense was precipitated by family favoritism. So that was a seed that was planted early in Esau's life. And the seed developed into a plant and the tree and the fruit with consequences. I want you to look at your life, your emotions, and ask yourself the question, in my life, is there any seed? Is there any lack? Is there any need of constant affirmation and validation I need? Luke chapter 15, we have the story of the elder brother. He got offended. He served in the house. And he served faithfully. But he had a spirit of entitlement. My father owes me something. And this is what happens. When you have a spirit of offense deep down in your soul, when somebody else gets blessed or promoted, you get offended. And you want to worry. But you want to go back to the root. John the Baptist made a very interesting statement. He said the axe must be laid to the root. That's why I believe just coming up here for an altar call and laying empty hands on an empty head won't bring transformation. You have to work on yourself. And it's hard work. Because everything you try to build on, the enemy will try to destroy. I know. And the moment you make a decision to deal with the spirit of offense in your life and you don't have discernment, there will be something that will come your way to challenge your right to progress. You are all look like a bunch of angels from up here. The second The second is insecure. Insecurity and offense are closely related. And I want to look at the life of a king called Saul. You know, Saul was king. He was anointed. He won battles. And God had a destiny for him. As he has for every one of us. But it's very interesting because when you read Saul's life story from 1st uh, Samuel chapter 2, 3, downwards very slowly, you see that when the people of Israel and Samuel were looking to make Saul a king, they couldn't find him. He was hiding amongst the stuff. Saul had issues of self-esteem. And people who are Poor self-esteem, which is contrary to pride, are very insecure. They're very insecure. 
and they sometimes don't understand where that insecurity was sourced. Childhood. Everything begins at childhood but doesn't need to end there. So, first Samuel chapter 13, was it Saul, Samuel carried seven days according to the set time, Samuel didn't show up, and Saul is under pressure because the people are following him trembling with a weak leader. And verse 7, after he had gone in and offered the burnt offering, Samuel said, what have you done? Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, not from God, they were scattered from my leadership because I didn't have the resonance and the ability to lead them constructively. That thou camest not within the time appointed. And the Philistines have gathered together. Therefore, I said, I will offer myself now. Insecure people always find somebody else to hang their coat on. It's always somebody else's fault. You know what I realized? In this modern day and age, you can't lead from a title. People don't follow you. Unless they see something in you, they want to buy into you first before they buy into your ministry. The people are following him trembling. He was insecure and he moved outside the God ordained boundaries. And God told him, if you were obedient, verse 13, 14, the kingdom would have never departed from you. David was never God's choice, but God had to find the substitute to replace Saul. Wow. David was insecure himself. David fits all the neg negative emotions. But whenever David was confronted with those emotions, he rose above them because he always shot at them. That's the difference between success and failure. Some people change jobs more than they change their jackets. And it's always the bus's fault. No, there's something going on inside and unless we fix the inside, the outside will never fix itself. First Samuel 18, we see a repetition. Verse 28, sorry, 18, verse 7 and 8. And the women answered one another as they played. David is returning from the battle of the Philistines. He is he's coming back after a success. And the ladies, Says Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And the saying displeased Saul. And they have ascribed unto David ten thousand and to me only thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul like David from that day. Wow. Words. Insecure people must be careful that they don't listen to the wrong words. You know, you have to be careful which voice you listen to. Especially in this day and age. And, and you do something and, and, and somebody will come and tell you, you know, were, were you thanked for that? You should have been thanked. And you get sucked in. The word in the original scandal means you get sucked in. Yeah, I think. I should have been then. If you are working in the job, you get paid. You are not working for nothing. So don't expect the thank you. The paycheck is enough. Hello? Am I there or what? Have I lost you? 
if you are constantly looking for affirmation, there is something missing in the dominoes of your life. And you want to ask God to finish. People who are insecure live by comparisons. And they are never happy because they always want something that someone else is. God had brought David and Saul together in a divine partnership to achieve a greater purpose. But because Saul was insecure and selfish and David was selfless, Saul missed out. Now, around me are people, some of whom have greater gifts than me, in a different area of gifting, and I am comfortable with that. Because I am secure in my calling God. I am called, you aren't. I love it. God takes the foolish things of the world, so no flesh can glory in you. And I have had to sit down in my Christian life early and, and deal with my insecurities. And I began to realize one thing, that the only person that can cause me to lose my destiny or live a less than life is not the people around me, but me. And that brought me a little security to me. That I don't need to be defined by somebody else's success. And I look at some of these articulate preachers who look as if they have chewed, chewed a dictionary. And I look at Joel Austin and he's all gelled up. I'm sure it's a wig. And I ask my wife, honey, can I wear a wig? I don't need a week to look good. If any of you are wearing one, apologies. <laughs> Once long, long ago, I was in some place and I cutted some very hard, I won't tell you where it was, and the wigs moved. <laughs> Not the spirit moved, the wig moved. Anything is possible in this modern day and age? Insecurity happens when we focus on what others are doing and we drain the oxygen out of the room and we have no energy left to do what God wants us to do. You know, some of you are Facebook ads, social media ads. You spend a lot of your time looking at what other people are. Waste of energy. Your emotional energy is sucked out and you lose your purpose. Throw that thing away. That's become an obsession to your life. It's an addiction. We talk about smoking as an addiction. This is worse. You can't smoke 200 cigarettes a day, but you can look at your Facebook or social media or Twitter, it depends on which level you are on in life, and you, you want to 2,000 times. And your oxygen is drained. By the way, if any of you are on my Facebook page, I'm cutting all of you out, because I have no energy to sit and look at what's happening in your life. My Facebook page is only to deal with people who are ministry connected to me. I've been wanting to say that for a long time. I am not interested that your dog has fleas. I'm not. That's not my core and purpose in life. I'm not interested how you make 
Malaysian, whatever. You see that? I'm not interested how cute you look. My energy gets drained as does yours. Social media can be the greatest tool to propagate the message of God's love and acceptance if we do it in a graceful way, not a legalistic way. I look at some of those things and I think, my God, if I am a non-Christian, I don't want this from a bar of stone. There is a responsibility that God holds to propagate the message of God's love and unconditional acceptance in a graceful way, not a legal way. Ouch, that hurts. Insecurity. And it is not a problem with insecurity. It perpetuates itself to the next generation. How many of you are in Germany? Put your hand up. Come on. Husbands, put your hand up. How many of you find this painful? Only one. I love you enough to tell you the truth. The destructive cycle of insecurity perpetuates. In the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6, we have the story of a good marriage that went bad. Can you show that? Put the lights on. Can you see this? Wow. You know what that is? You can put the lights on again. That's a good marriage that went bad. And it didn't go bad intentionally. And my heart goes out to people who have to struggle with tensions in their marriage today more so than 20 or 30 years ago because we didn't have all the destruction, destructive behaviors and distractions to take us away from each other. 30 years ago, we, if we wanted to spend a romantic deal, we went to the liberty. Three dollars, three rupees sixty. Now you have a gold pass, and that's a hundred bucks. So your wife wants to go gold pass, and you say, can we do it on the short things or drink all the time? Yes, in cheap scales. <laughs> Verse 16, and as after the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, was looking through the window. Wow. She's the queen. She's the queen. Michael, Saul's daughter, is always preached in a bad night. She was a good woman. She just had a bad husband. Hello. You have to balance this thing off, I was told. A lot of ladies come and say, Pastor, when are you going to preach on the husbands? Wow, I like that. They are anointed. She looked through a window and saw the king leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. You see, time changes everything. And changes us. The person you married 20 years ago isn't the person who is doing it. She was the queen of Israel. She had a voice but she chose the wrong words, the wrong place, and the wrong time 
to give expression to the deities. Because she was human, David had married her. David was a conniving, deceitful, he had more angles than Jacob. And yet there was something, I don't know, that God saw in David that I certainly can't see when I read the story over and over again. Man, after God's heart, yeah, I didn't know, it looks good. He was conniving. And, and I, I'm sure that David in his immaturity thought this is a shortcut to the throne, marrying the throne of the king. He says, Michael loved David. She risked her life for him. But not once in that entire story does it say David loved his wife. He loved Jonathan. And once again we come back to the roots. In David's life, his father never fathered him the way he should have. Psalm 27, verse 10, David says, Though my father and mother forsake me, God is the strength of my life. And that affected his relationship with his spouse. And he had to run away. And for about 10 to 14 years, roughly, they were separated. And Michael had married a guy who loved her and looked after her. And when he became king, the first thing he did, he said, get me my wife. Wow. And he just brought him to the palace and there were so many other wives around and kids. Here. And I am sure when David walked around the palace and he looked at a cute young kid with blue eyes and blonde hair, he said, ah, those kids, who oh, was Who's the dad? And the little packer said, you do. That's the type of guy David was. David had this drive in him that never really came under God's control. He had everything else under God's control, but not this one. He at the end of his life, they had to bring uh, Shunammai and keep her next to David and when there was no movement, they knew he was dead. Wow, what a way to discover that. It's another story. You see, she was entitled to feel love. She was entitled to be angry. She was entitled to be cheated. But she would have turned the story around. She allowed the same insecurity of her father's honor to be perpetuated in her. And she said, oh, look at her king the way he's behaving. That's sad. You see, she was the king's daughter. And according to Hebrew tradition, you conducted yourself as a daughter of a king. And they say in the writings, when Nicole walked, she walked like this. But there, he was all over. And so rather than trying to change him, she had an opportunity to say change him. There was a strain in the marriage. It wasn't visible on the outside. Like most marriages. There are strains. But we have to be careful that we don't let the strain speak. She should have been leading the parade of the women. That's what Miriam did. And yet she chose to stay at home and look at everything out the window. Coming back to that thing we saw there, you tear down your marriage by fighting to be right 
Ramananda then could be reconciled. You tear down your children with constant criticism, forgetting there is only one perfect father, and even children will always do what is right. You tear down the church with divisiveness, forgetting that the body of Christ is made up of different parts that are designed to work together and against each other. You tear down your workplace with gossip and constant complaining, being the problem rather than the solution. Let the switch hammer go. You know, in a, in a marital struggle, nobody wins. Everybody loses. And you know who loses most? The children. The children. Nobody wins. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 1, talks about the woman who builds her house. Every wise woman builds her house, but a foolish one tears it down with her own name. That's the story of Nika. It's a sad story for me, the saddest in the Bible. I weep when I read the story and enter the emotion of it. Because she had every right to feel the way she felt. But what she wanted from David, he couldn't ever give. Because he hadn't received it himself. Her destiny, her dream. She could have brought forth the Messiah of the world. But instead, God had to choose an adulterous woman through whom he was going to propagate his grace. That's it. Here is faithfulness and loyalty on one hand. And on the other hand is unfaithfulness and disloyalty. Yet it was out of that line that the Messiah come because the one who was faithful and loyal allowed negative emotions to control that destiny and do this. I, I, my heart breaks for people who go through this, who go through separation. Because I think I understand to some extent the pain it brings. And nobody wins. And that's the role of the enemy to rob us of our destiny. Anger, fear. God has not, 2 Timothy 1 7, God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Joshua chapter 1 1 12, three times. God tell Joshua, be strong and have good courage. Be strong and have good courage. Because he was fearful. He was apprehensive. What does the future hold for me? What if I step out and get into that Jordan River and that river doesn't part? Fear is a natural response when we feel life is out of control. But we got to realize as Christians, God will allow life to get out of control so that we can learn to give him control. You learn it quickly on the heart. Anger. Numbers 20 verse 11, God told him, Moses speak to the rock and he struck the rock. Because right through Moses' life he had anger issues. And, and once again, once again, you see he's called the son of Pharaoh's Daughter, he had no father in his early childhood. That affected his life emotionally. Anger is one sure sign that you have lived a less than life in the area of emotional input from a father. 
And your father wasn't a bad father. He just didn't know how to do it. Because his grandfather and great-grandfather. And you, you know, I was talking to somebody here uh, who was, we were talking about the U.S. state penitentiary system. And there are grandfathers, fathers and children all in the same jail. All in the same place. Wow. All with the same issue in them. And we all get angry. And there is an emotion. God gets angry. But the Bible says, do not let the sun set on you. Conflict resolution must become a priority even when you don't feel like it. Wow. So how do we deal with this complex thing? Number one, take responsibility for your emotions. Say, look, I think I've got some issues. Don't put it off. Deal with issues one at a time. Build into your life some emotional help as the number one priority. And you can't do that by just reading your Bible because you don't know where all the scriptures are. Get a book. See a counselor. Be humble enough to say, I think I need help. Somebody told me I need 20 sessions in counseling. I agree. I will think around 40. I'm sure some of you say amen. But I've learned to try to handle my emotions by releasing them. And every time I have the temptation to get angry, I start ministering in opposite space. And it changed the dynamic of my life. When somebody cuts in front of me, when I'm driving, I want to get out of that first gear and take that next to the answer and go like the guy in the movies. But then I say, well, it, 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 it releases the toxins from my body and I am healthy about it. Number two, see your anger through the experiences of those who are damaged by you. See your anger through the eyes of those who are damaged by it. Three, acknowledge the anger of your forefathers, Exodus 25 and 6. Break the cycle of anger violence. Make sure it doesn't pass on to your children. <laughs> Number four, place personal rights under God's control. It's possible. With the grace of God. And when your kids die, I and mean, when you die, your kids are saying, I take you home. Yeah. He's come. You know, I, I, I have people, young guys, tell me, I have never been like my father. Go oh, home. Wow. Wow. You. See, see the fire. It, it's emotional. But we have to make a choice. God, I want to change the beginning of me. Begin with me. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 says, I am complete in Him. I am complete in Him. So God can pour His grace into your life so that you can find a Don't try to change somebody else. Because there are enough of stuff inside you that needs changing first. Work more on your health than the health of somebody else. You want to be good. And suddenly you look back and go, ah, I think I made progress. It's a choice. It's hard work. But when you go halfway, God will meet you there. It's a journey. Nobody is saying it's easy. It's like cloud climbing the thousand steps in Dandelion. And you want to quit halfway. But the question you have to ask yourself, or I ask myself, is, do I want to live a less than life just because some of these things held me back? Held me back. Show me. I'll ask the worship team to come along. You just want to make a personal choice this morning to change. That's the same.
You just put your hand up and put Lama prayers. I won't call you for that. It's just you and God. Yes. 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 I have some anger issues, insecurity. Just put your hand up and put my hand up and pray. You, you just want to say, God, I need help. I can't do this by myself. It's human. It takes human for God to move in your life. Just a few moments. You want help. God is wanting to do something in you and through you. Just put your hand up and put it up. Thank you. Father, we just thank you that you can give us the grace. You can give us the name to live a life that can make a difference. Lord, we know these are destiny destroyers. Offense destroyed Cain. He became a vagabond on the face of the earth. Insecurity robbed Saul of his destiny as king. Father, anger. As a consequence of anger, Moses couldn't enter the promised land. Help us not to live a less than life because our emotions have been. 